pastor has an 8 o'clock service and that's nice for me. I do love Sunday night service, even though really, actually, we weren't as spiritual as the Christian church next door to my home, because their Sunday night service was at 7 a.m. And so they had to be even, even earlier than us Baptists were, amen? And so some of us get up with the chickens anyway, so it's not a big problem. And praise the Lord for Easter Sunday. Praise the Lord for this day as we celebrate the amen. resurrection of our Lord. Let's get our Bibles today and turn to Matthew, or I'm sorry, the book of Mark chapter 16. I always gave you my text for uh, the worship service this morning. From Mark chapter 16 this morning, as we consider the resurrection this morning, just some thoughts today I want to share with you. And this message will maybe be more than one, will be devotional, more so than a, than a, than a typical preaching message. But the book of Mark <coughs> chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. You know, I'm thankful for the hope that we have in Christ compared to other religions of the world. You think about all the 1.8 billion Muslims around the world today. When Muhammad died, he was buried and he decomposed. <clears throat> and he's still dead. But our Savior, and I could mention many other religions, but our Savior, after prophesying his death, burial, and resurrection, he conquered the grave. Amen. And he's alive this morning. And he's coming back again very soon. As we look at the book of Mark chapter 16, beautiful passage here, verses 1 through 8, we will consider how prayer and then get into the Word of God together for a few minutes today. The Bible says that when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? There is the question we want to look at this morning. A question they asked before they ever arrived at the sepulchre. Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were frightened. And he said to them, Be not afraid. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you in the Galilee. There shall you see him. And he said, and as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they, they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man. For they were afraid. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts this morning. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we can read in all four Gospels, not only of your death and your burial, but Lord, we also read of your glorious resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that you today are ever living to make intercession for us. And Lord, we pray now today as we consider these verses of Scripture this morning, I pray you would speak to our hearts. We pray it now in Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray. Amen. The events of the day that Jesus died are recorded for us in Mark 15. What a dark day. What a difficult day for the followers of the Lord Jesus. I'll probably make more remarks about that during the worship hour today. But now before sunset, or the day before the Sabbath, Jesus was laid in the grave, and the stone was rolled across the door to the sepulcher. See them that too. Early on Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, of the, 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 the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spice. They might come and anoint him. Now, I think one of the most privileged people in the Bible was the woman who took the alabaster box because she broke that ointment and she anointed the Lord. And these these individuals now they come to the tomb looking for an opportunity to anoint his body, but it's too late. You know why he'd already resurrected, amen? You think about that, that gift that she offered when she gave the Lord her very best, and though she was criticized for it, she got a privilege that other, other women did not have. She had the privilege of anointing the body of Jesus before he died. You know, it's been said we should show the flowers before, people, we should throw the flowers before people die, amen? And she had that privilege of <laughs> taking that sweet ointment, that alabaster box, and breaking it. But now they've come out of their honor, out of their respect for the Savior, the Messiah. They've come to anoint the body of Jesus early in the morning. The Sabbath has now passed. 
And, and so we find as, we, as they come there on that Sunday morning, the question was asked, who shall roll away the stone from the door? And when they looked, the stone was already rolled away. What a blessing, amen? The stone was already rolled away. As we think about the power of the New Testament Christianity, it is not just the cross, but the empty tomb. You know, when you think about history, in history there were thousands of Jews crucified on crosses. There were criminals crucified on crosses. Multitudes of them. And then in 70 AD, when Israel was destroyed under, under the Roman emperor, in 70 AD there were so many Jews crucified that there were no trees left. They cut down every tree and they crucified thousands of Jews upon, upon crosses all over that land, long after the cross that we're reading about in the Word of God. But one thing that, that none of those crosses have in common with the cross of Christ is number one, who was nailed there? And second of all, he is the only victim of crucifixion that physically conquered the grave. That physically conquered the grave. Jesus Christ did not just swoon on the cross, he did die. Jesus Christ truly died on that cross, laid in the broad tomb, and he conquered the grave on that, on that early Sunday morning. When the stone was rolled away, there are several things that were rolled away on that day. And I want to talk about that this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, that the penalty for sin was rolled away. Amen? You know, sin carries with it a death penalty. There's been much discussion in our world about whether the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. And, of course, we know that the, that the original penalty for sin is death. You remember our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the garden. When God placed them there in that beautiful, untarnished, uncursed world, a world totally free from thorns or thistles or sorrow or pain, there was only one commandment. And the Lord said, Of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, be it said of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Do you realize that sin from the very beginning carried with it a death penalty? Amen? And we can discuss the death penalty all day, whether we agree or do not agree with whether government should carry out the death penalty. But I can say this to you today, that God established the death penalty for sin. And the very first thing that happened to our first parents when they disobeyed God is that they spiritually died. They became spiritually dead. Second of all, their physical bodies began to die. And had there not been a means whereby their sins could be forgiven and covered and atoned for, they would have died eternally. They would have died eternally. I happen to believe that we'll see our first parents in heaven. I believe that. There's other people that do not agree with that. But I believe because Abel understood the proper sacrifice, that I believe that Adam and Eve were taught the proper sacrifice and received a covering and atonement for their sin. And I believe that our first parents, we will see them in glory. I believe that. I believe, I'll be very disappointed not to see Adam and Eve in glory. And I understand that they were responsible for original sin, particularly Adam, because the Bible says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men. You know, we're shocked by death, but we shouldn't be, really, when you think about the fact that death is the natural consequence in our world of sin. And not personal sin. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that because one person dies prematurely before another, that, that that's a result of their personal sin. It could be, but the reality is in most cases it's not. Death is simply a reality of the world in which we live because of the presence of sin. But God did not create the world to be a place of death. He created the world to be a place of life. And heaven, one day if we get to heaven, we will all have access to that tree of life once again. And we will enjoy the eternal presence of God forever and forever and forever. What a joy that is to think about that today. But you see, sin's penalty was rolled away. What is sin's penalty? The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so sin's penalty was rolled away. And then, so we see that in the Word of God. You see, sin had to be paid for. The eternal penalty for sin is an eternal death penalty. Ezekiel 18, verse 4, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so sin carries with it the death penalty, but when Jesus conquered the grave, the penalty for sin was rolled away, when that stone was rolled away. What a glorious truth this morning. Get your Bible if you wouldn't turn to Romans chapter 5 with me this morning. The book of Romans chapter 5. Yeah. <laughs> As we consider this, this truth a little bit further this morning. I'm thankful today that sin's penalty was rolled away. In the book of Romans 5, look at verse 10 and 11. 
It says in verse 10, for if, when we were enemies, have you ever seen yourself as an enemy of God? Well, in reality, all of us as sinners, before we repented, before we believed on the Lord Jesus, though we don't like to look at ourselves that way, oftentimes we were enemies of God. And the way we conducted and lived our lives was in opposition to God's divine righteousness. And so the Bible says we were enemies, but then it says we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You know, the death of Christ is emphasized and preached a lot. But the reality is it's not just His death that gave us life, it's His life that gives us life. The fact that Jesus Christ is alive. We are not saved by the death of Christ alone, but we are saved by His life. The eternal penalty for sin was rolled away when the stone, when the stone was rolled away. I want you to see a second thing that was rolled away when that stone was rolled away. All doubt was rolled away. You think about those days preceding the cross. And of course the, the nation had turned in, in, in faith to Christ as the Messiah. In fact, on that Palm Sunday, which we celebrated last Sunday, on um, that Palm Sunday, they said, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they threw their coats, and they threw the palm branches as he rode on that, on that folded ass into Jerusalem. And they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And, and they, were, they were rejoicing over their king coming into the land. And in the, in, as he rode into Jerusalem there as the king of kings and lord of lords. But just one week later, he's betrayed. And he is falsely accused. And he is tortured and beaten and taken out and crucified. Can you imagine the sorrow that filled the hearts of the disciples and followers? There was a lot of fickle followers. Amen. I think in, in our world today we have a lot of fickle followers. We have a lot of people that are not really genuine followers. They kind of get carried along with the crowd. If it's popular to be a Christian, they get carried along with the crowd. But deep in their heart, they're not dedicated followers. But their, their joy on the, that Palm Sunday was turned quickly to sorrow and to pain. When you think about the fact that their Messiah, the one that they placed their hope in, the one that they believed would be the Savior of Israel, you see, they didn't understand as fully as we do. We have a much clearer and a fuller understanding of all that transpired than they did. That their, their vision was somewhat clouded because they were looking for a Messiah to deliver Israel from Roman domination. They were under heavy taxation. They've been a conquered people. They, they longed for freedom. They longed for the day that would come when their Messiah would come and Israel could return to her glory days. And that was basically their vision for a Messiah. This idea of a Messiah that would actually have to suffer and die and be buried was far beyond their, 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 their whole expectation of Him. And so you imagine the sorrow that over, overfilled their hearts when their Messiah, the one that they put all their hopes into has now been betrayed by Judas. He's being falsely accused and now being publicly tortured and taken out of a cruel cross and crucified. What a sorrowful time that had to be for the disciples. What a sorrowful time that had to be for Mary. What a sorrowful time that had to be for Mary Magdalene out of whom Jesus had cast seven devils. As I think about these ladies that arrived early that morning at the tomb, you know, it's been said that ladies were the last ones at the cross and the first ones at the tomb. And you know, I thank God for Christian ladies. Amen? And they, they were there. The disciples were, were assembled off in a room somewhere for fear of the Jews, thinking, well, they've got Jesus. They're coming after us next. But the women, they, they were bold. And they were there as, as Jesus' body is being removed from the cross. And they were there when, when they when long before, before the sun came up. They were there uh, to anoint the body of Jesus there. But you find here that all doubt was rolled away. You see, throughout the life of Christ, there were many who believed in Jesus, and but yet there were some that doubted. Even Thomas, after Jesus was crucified, after he appeared, said, I will not believe unless I can thrust my hand into his side and touch the nails, or touch the hands where the nails were pierced. And so there were many that doubted. But when the stone rolled away, the empty tomb removed all doubt. And you know something? It should remove all doubt for us as well today. It should remove all doubt. Uh, there have been skeptics down through the centuries. And there have been a long list of them. Who did not believe in Christianity. Who did not believe in the Bible. But through a thorough investigation of the events of the, of the cross and the resurrection have come to faith in Christ. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on today. 
But see, doubt was destroyed when the, thorough, when the stone was rolled away. The empty tomb forever settles the question of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me just for a moment. You're in Romans. Look at Romans chapter 1. And look at a couple of verses here. Look at verse 3. The Bible says in Romans 1 verse 3, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Look at verse 4. Here's the key. And declared it to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. You see, Jesus Christ, His Lordship, is, is, valid, is made valid through the resurrection. Jesus Christ basically would be a false prophet had it not been for the resurrection. Because Jesus prophesied on numerous times that He would suffer, and that He would be buried. And he would rise again the third day. If that's not a reality, he's not a true prophet. It is a reality. He is a true prophet. Amen? His prophecy was fulfilled concerning himself. And, and so we can rejoice in that this morning. So doubt should be dispelled. If Jesus Christ can conquer the grave, and here's a very practical thing, what can he not conquer in my life and your life? Is there anything bigger than passing from death to life? Is there any, is there any situation you face in life that is greater than the, the situation those early disciples faced. When that stone was rolled away, all doubt was rolled away. I want you to notice thirdly this morning, the power of Satan was rolled away. I'm sure that Satan was convinced that he had the victory. When now the sinless Son of God, though he was the perfect man and had never sinned, I'm sure Satan believed in his deluded and deceived mind. I'm sure he believed the victory had been won when they'd taken Jesus and he'd been rejected and he'd been accused and he'd been crucified. I'm sure that he believed that he had the victory. But I want you to notice in the book of 1 John 3, 8, if you'll turn there with me, <coughs> and the purpose and the power of the cross. The power of the cross. The purpose and the power of the cross. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. I love this verse. The Bible says, He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. But look at the next sentence. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, Satan had the power of death. But now that power has been taken from him with the resurrection. With the resurrection, that power of death that Satan has had. And so the power of Satan was rolled away. When God was manifest in the flesh that he might destroy the works of the devil. The gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was God's judgment upon the prince of this world. Jesus said, now is the prince of this world judged because I go to my father. Jesus, through his resurrection, conquered Satan who had the power of death. One of the main purposes of Christ's coming in the world was to, 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 was to defeat Satan. That was one of his number one purposes. When the stone was rolled away, the power of Satan was rolled away. And the gospel, we now have the power with the preaching of the gospel literally to snatch people from the burning. Praise God for that. Amen. Satan no longer has a hold upon them. Why? The power of the resurrection is more powerful than any, any Satan's power. Does Satan have power? Yes, he does. But I want to tell you, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Do you believe that this morning, church? I hope you do. The reality is this morning that his power, the power of Jesus Christ because of the resurrection, Satan's power, Satan's hold on this world was destroyed. Satan's kingdom became a defeated kingdom when the stone was rolled away. I want you to notice also this morning the power of sin was rolled away. By the way, sin is powerful, isn't it? We see its effect all around us in our world today. And we see the pain that sin brings. You know, sin has always brought horrible pain to the world. You ever think about being the first parent, Adam and Eve? And of course, they gave birth to that son with hope, Cain. You remember what Eve said? She said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And they had already been given the prophecy of the coming Messiah. And actually, what, what, what Eve was saying is, I've gotten the Messiah from the Lord. Perhaps he's come. Well, what a disappointment. When, when God had given them the proper way of sacrifice and Abel, had, had offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, where he received witness that he was righteous, and Cain's works were evil. Cain arose and killed his own brother. Can you imagine the sorrow? I can't imagine the sorrow. It's more, it's difficult enough to lay to rest a child. And I've not had to have that sorrow in my life. 
but I know many that have had to lay to rest one of their own children. But you think about this, can you imagine the pain of knowing that your son took the life of his brother? That's, that's what sin brought in this world. It brought sorrow. It brought pain. And we still see the effects of sin. I mean, we saw it last week when we saw a beloved officer lose his life serving and protecting. You say, why does that happen in the world? Because sin is still in the world. That's why it happened. We don't like it. We, we don't like the consequence of sin. You know, we live in a world today that glorifies sin. It's an amazing world that glorifies sin. And, uh, but we don't like the consequences of sin. And even the world who doesn't believe in God or believe in, in, in sin as you, as you will, even our world doesn't like the effects of sin. Because sin brings forth death and suffering and pain. And that's the way sin was from the beginning. It hasn't changed today. Amen? That reminds me of the, of the day that uh, uh, President Coolidge's wife came home. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, he came home from church services one Sunday. Calvin Coolidge was known as Silent Cow. And uh, his wife asked him, did you enjoy church? He said, I did. She said, well, the preacher, preach on today at the church. He said, sin. She said, well, what did he say about it? And he said, he was again it. Amen. <laughs> well, as preachers, we should be against sin. Amen. As churches, we should be against sin. And, you know, our community has been promoting sin. Isn't that a sad day that our community is promoting and protecting sin in this, in this community? What a sad day that is. But sin always has the same deadly consequence. And, you know, sin can be beautiful, but it's still deadly. I was reading an article yesterday that I was not aware of, of these beautiful Bradford pear trees. And they are very beautiful. But the problem is they cross pollinate. And though they're some of the prettiest trees in the spring, and even in the fall they're some of the prettiest trees, they are cross pollinating with our good pear trees. And they're actually destroying them. And though they look beautiful, they're not really a good thing. Amen? And I, I always love the ornamental pear trees. Don't you love the beauty of their white flowers? And they come out early in the spring. They seem like their leaves turn beautiful and last longer than any other tree. Very beautiful, but certainly beautiful, but I did not know until I read this article that they're also deadly and they're trying to eliminate them because they're what they're doing. And both eventually they will destroy all of the healthy trees. Because they're because they're a negative strain. Well, you know, that's the way sin is in the world. Amen. It can look beautiful. It can be painted up well. It can be attractive, amen. But the problem with it is it's destructive. Amen. Sin is destructive. It's not only destructive, it's deadly. And this is why Jesus had to die. Have you ever thought about this? On the cross, why did Jesus have to die? He had to die because sin's penalty was death. When the stone was rolled away, you need to understand that not only was the power of Satan rolled away, but the power of sin was rolled away. That's why we can read the book of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn there for a moment. I love this great resurrection chapter. I hope you become familiar with 1 Corinthians 15 in your life because it's the resurrection chapter. And I don't have time today, obviously, to read the whole chapter. If I did, we'd be here well into breakfast. But look at chapter 15 toward the end of the chapter. Look at verse 51. Here's the hope we have. Most of the time, we only read this at funerals. <laughs> and we, we sort of think it's only connected with that, with that context. But the reality is this, is this is a glorious passage for us at any time in life. The Bible says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now that's a promise that there will be a generation that will be alive when Jesus returns. That will go without dying. The Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that means suddenly, unexpectedly, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You know, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that David spoke about, and I know even Job wrote about his till his change comes. I love that passage where it says that I will be satisfied when I awake in his likeness. That's something that will be true of every believer. Now, God is doing that inward work now. The Bible says, though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day, day by day. Now, you may feel like, well, I'm aging, I'm getting older, and that's true. That's true of every one of us. But we're getting younger on the inside. Amen? Though there might be a reverse, the reverse effect of sin externally, internally, we're becoming more like Christ as we grow in the Lord. As we, as we walk with the Lord all these many years. 
We're becoming more like him on the inside. And one day what's on the inside will show more than what's on the outside. And so the Bible says in verse, in verse 15, For this corruptible must put on corruption. This mortal must put on immortality. You know, our world tries to do all they can do, even spending, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, plastic surgery in America, where people are trying to reverse the effects of aging. And I've even seen examples of people who actually physically made themselves look worse because they, they attempted to use plastic surgery. And uh, there's many examples of that where they actually look, uh, look hideous, amen? Well, what are they trying to do? They're trying to reverse the effect of something that cannot be reversed. Aging is going to take place. This corruptible must put an eruption. This mortal must put an immortality. You know, many of the great Hollywood stars, when they grew old, would go into, uh, they would become recluses. They would hide themselves because they could not stand for themselves not to appear the way that they had appeared in their beauty on the stage and on the screen. And they would hide and become recluses from society. That was not an uncommon thing. And I can give you a list of famous actresses who would not even go out publicly because they wanted people to remember them as they were in the, in the height of their beauty. Well, you know, to me, the greatest beauty is not external beauty, but it's internal beauty. And be, someone being beautiful on the inside, and that's a far greater beauty. The Bible says that's, a, that's, a, a, that's beyond price. The virtuous woman, her beauty is, is beyond, beyond the purchase price. But you look here at the Word of God, the Bible says here, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that death is swallowed in victory. But not only, not only is death swallowed up, but, but what caused death is destroyed. And that's sin. Look what the Bible says. Verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But look at verse 56. The sting of death is sin. You see, sin was rolled away. Sin and sin's penalty, which is death, was rolled away. When Jesus Christ, when that stone was rolled away, praise the Lord, sin's power was rolled away. And I want you to know that that power is available to the Christian today. We are to walk in the power of the resurrection. We're not to walk in the power of the old nature. We're to walk in the power of the new nature. You know, when we get baptized and we go beneath the waters of baptism, it is a picture of the fact that the old sinful Adamic person we were has been put to death and has been crucified with Christ. When we come up out of that water, what do we say? Raised in the likeness of His resurrection to walk in newness of life. Amen? Praise the Lord. We come out of that walk. That's a picture of the fact that not did Jesus come out of His grave, but that we come out of our grave of sin. That we now are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? I think one of the greatest pictures of that in, in nature is the, is the caterpillar. Caterpillars are not the most attractive creature. Amen? But they will, they will go in the fall of the year and begin to construct that cocoon. And they make that cocoon, and they crawl inside, and the creature that comes out doesn't look anything like the one that went in. In fact, for years they thought, well, the caterpillar must actually change and just grow some wings. And they discovered that in that cocoon, <coughs> science doesn't know to this day how it happens, that that creature that crawls in there becomes nothing more than a blob of goo. And then there's a complete metamorphosis, and that's the, that's the Greek word that is used, the scientific word that takes place. And literally, a new creation happens within the cocoon, a new creation. So that what comes out of that cocoon in the spring of the year doesn't even have the nature of the caterpillar that crawled in. What a beautiful picture of salvation, amen? The person that you and I were outside of Christ before we went into our cocoon of, of the grave, amen? A totally new person comes out. The person we are in Christ is a brand new creation. Amen? What a beautiful picture. So the power of sin was destroyed. Think about this this morning then. Sin's penalty was rolled away. All doubt was rolled away. Satan's power was rolled away. But sin's power also as well in our personal lives has been rolled away. One final passage. The book of Romans chapter 6. Let's turn there together. Romans chapter 6, just a word of exhortation as we consider these truths this resurrection morning. Chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin 
that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know the resurrection behooves us, encourages us, ought to influence us not to live the way that we lived before. Because we've been risen with Christ, and I know that Colossians says that as well. It says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You know, if heaven is your home, that's what you should see. You know, there are a few places that feel like heaven on earth. We were down on the beautiful Emerald Coast, and you know something? It was the paradise, but it wasn't heaven. Amen? It was a beautiful place, but it wasn't heaven. The reality is we're going to heaven. Our citizenship is already there. Amen? If we are risen with Christ, we're to seek the things which are above, not the things which are on the earth. Why? Because you're dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so today, on this, on this resurrection morning, as we celebrate our risen Savior together, as we think about that early Sunday morning when they came and their sorrow was turned to joy to discover an empty tomb, you think about the thousands of people throughout the centuries who go to visit cemeteries to take flowers in memory of those that are there. Praise the Lord that when they went to the tomb of Jesus, they went to celebrate one who was not there. He conquered the grave. He's alive today, and because he lives, we will live also. Let's stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're not going to have an invitation today. We would like to maybe have a piano song. If you would just play silently right now, play, play quietly, I mean, the song is we have prayer. We can't play, play silently. We can pray silently. Amen. We can. We can play silently. We just uh, play something on the piano. We're going to we're going to close this time with a word of prayer. We thank the Lord for His resurrection. Let's just bow for prayer as Mary plays for us. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you today for the resurrection. We thank you for that old broken cross that Mary is playing right now. Lord, we thank you and are thankful today that it didn't end on the cross. We well, thank you, Lord, that you conquered the cross, or conquered the cross, conquered death. Lord, we thank you that you're alive this morning. We thank you that we can pray to you. We thank you that we can know that you're interceding for us this morning. That you ever live to make intercession for us. Lord, we thank you that when you come to the grave, that so many things that were so negative were conquered along with it, doubt and fear. Lord, we thank you that our sin was conquered. We thank you that Satan was conquered. We thank you that he's a conquered foe this morning. Lord, I pray today as we leave this service, we would leave here in that power and consider the power of that resurrection. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And for his sake we pray. Amen.